In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. How many of us who are younger, or maybe those of us who are older remember, you have a toy, you have a game, you have a machine, you have a piece of you know, whatever, electronics, Xbox, whatever it is, you're trying to get it to work. And you hit the on button, you switch whatever, and it's not working. You try to do whatever. Or you're trying to get on the internet at home on your laptop, and you're not connecting. Something's wrong with the router. You check your Wi-Fi connection on your laptop, you do all the tests, you do whatever. And then all of a sudden you realize the problem is the router wasn't plugged on. Or that device that wasn't working simply wasn't plugged in. Or there's no batteries in the device. The device is simply not on. I think all of us have that experience, right? How many times have we tried to get something to work and we're frustrated and then we realize the main reason it wasn't working because something simple just wasn't there. And as soon as you plug it in or as soon as you switch it on or as soon as you add the batteries, it just starts to work again. If we imagine maybe a sillier scenario, you ask any doctor and you give him a cadaver, a dead body, and you tell the doctor, I want a heart transplant for this cadaver to make this body alive. The doctor will tell you it's already dead. It's not going to work. This isn't a Frankenstein movie. It's not going to work. No matter how many parts we replace, no matter what we try to do, that body is still dead. Maybe if we were in ER and a person is coming in, so long as there's still a pulse, so long as that person is still alive, so long as the heart is still beating, there may be a transplant, maybe changing an organ, maybe replacing something can save that person. But if that person is dead, then it's useless. And Jesus today does something very interesting when he talks about this idea of a change of being. He says that when you get an old rag, some old clothes, he says it doesn't work that you just patch it up with some new pieces. It's still old clothes. And what's he trying to say with that? He's trying to say, for example, Abuna Theodore can stand in front of a congregation and give a sermon. He could say all the most beautiful things in the whole wide world. People can come to church and attend liturgy and do the sacraments. Kids can come to Sunday school. Kids can go to Maharagan and win prizes and get trophies and win first place in the spiritual competition and, I don't know, get first place in the basketball tournament or whatever. And people can come to church every week and do all the right things. But if they're not plugged in, 
if they're dead, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't do anything. If we come here and there is no life, then everything we're doing doesn't really matter. Then the question is, what do we mean that we're dead? Or what do we mean that we're alive? We look at these interesting stories that we just read today. The story of Levi, who's Matthew. Jesus looks at him and says, follow me. And then he just gets up and follows him. Despite the fact that he was a horrible person. He's a tax collector. Now think of a tax collector, not just, you know, someone who works for the IRS, all right? A tax collector in the Jewish times of that first century Judea is someone almost the equivalent of a loan shark, someone who you would associate today with gangster casinos of Las Vegas. Add to that, you know, turncoat Benedict Arnold, traitor, Russian spy, put all that in one. I don't know. I can't, I'm not being, being very imaginative right now, but that's how the Jewish people viewed that person. Someone very rich, also very prone to being very abusive of their power, and also treacherous, a traitor to their people. And yet, we don't know if this was their, the first interaction between Jesus and Levi, Jesus and Matthew. Jesus just looks at him and he says, he was sitting at his desk and he said, follow me, and he sits up and walks. We don't know. But we know one thing. We know what Matthew became and what he ended up. The only reason we could guess that Matthew became that is because something in him was alive. There was a pulse. And we compare that to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, all those other learned people who were supposedly the good people, and they were doing all the right stuff. They were showing up to the synagogue every week, and they were doing all the right things, and they were saying all the right stuff, and that didn't matter. They were dead. They didn't have a pulse. And Jesus looked at those, and Jesus looked at him, and he knew who was who, and who was alive, and who was dead. And the Sinexar story today shows us something very similar. Someone is a Christian, and someone is a Jew. And you look even at the details of the story, and this man is called a Christian, and yet his heart is dead. You notice the story. He's complaining. He's bitter. Why are we poor? We don't have enough money. How come God gives these people more than we have? How come this? How come that? And then he decides, I want the money. I don't care about Christ. So he goes to this rich Jewish person. And it's kind of interesting because the man's Jewish and he has a Greek name, which means the love of the stranger, the lover of the stranger. So the man has love in his heart, Philoxenos. And the Jewish man says, look, I have a rule. I follow my religion. I can't have you live in my house because you're not a Jew. But if, if, you, if you're poor and you need money, I can give you charity. He's a lover of the stranger. So despite not being a Christian, he has a pulse. 
and he's willing to give, and he's willing to be kind, and he's willing to be generous. And God looks at that as something that was valuable. And that's why the story ends the way that we see when we read the rest of the story in the Sikhsa. The story ends with the reality that this man who was called a Christian ends up dead. And the Jews in the story who were not Christians become the real Christians because they were alive, because they had hearts, because they had a pulse. Now these stories become important towards the end of the year the end of the Coptic year, Misra, as we always say, is the last full Coptic month of the year. Because as we approach the end of the year, we always have to ask ourselves, where is our harvest? What fruit do we have to show at the end of the year? What are our results? If you want to think about it in terms of school. What's the report card looking like? So you read in the Pauline and the Catholic epistle, you know, St. Paul is telling, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother. Fathers don't provoke your children. Servants be obedient. Masters, where was it? Do the same things to them. Brethren be strong in the Lord. That's the A. Those are the A's. Those are the models. Those are the ideal answers. Those are the best scores. This is what we're supposed to look like. And of course, we measure ourselves against all of that, and we realize most of the time we're not doing such a good job. And we have to realize that without real repentance, without a real turning to God, we're dead. That's really the heart of it. We can try to patch things up. We can try to come to church, or if we're younger, coming to Sunday school, coming to youth group, coming whatever. But it's obvious that we're dead, because you could tell by the fruit. If we're doing all the right stuff, but the fruit is wrong, if there's still fights in our own homes, if there's still no growth spiritually in our lives, if we're still gossiping and bickering, if we're still bullying, if we're still you know, arguing within ourselves, if there's still bitterness between friends, is there, if there's still enmity between people in the same class, within a Sunday school class or within a youth group, if people don't know how to love one another, if there is no love of the stranger, if there's no feeling of community, then we're dead. There is no pulse. There is no real life. Then, as Jesus was saying, we're not really doing this idea of new wineskins. New wine must be put in new wineskins, then both are preserved, you know? You don't, we're not having a new garment. What is this idea of the garment? When, when we are baptized, every person who gets baptized, whether they're a little baby or an adult, they put on this white garment because it's this idea that they are made new, right? And as we get, move on in our life after we're baptized, that garment gets dirtied, gets ripped, gets torn. So how do we renew that garment? We don't merely try to patch it up. It has to be renewed all over again. And we renew it by repentance. We have to renew that covenant with Christ with every year, with every day, even with every hour. Because ultimately, being a Christian is answering the call that Jesus said to Matthew when he said, follow me. It's not about just doing some stuff, coming to church on Sunday and, okay, done. I came on Sunday morning, I took communion, 
By the way, we don't take communion. We receive it. It's Jesus giving us his body. He says, take my body. He's giving it to us. And we receive it, thankfully. Sometimes when I wonder when we say, I'm taking communion, it's like I'm picking it up from the driveway, the drive through We need to have that spirit of repentance and that spirit of thinking that we need our lives renewed. When we read the story of Acts today, when that young man, Eutychus, when he fell from the window and he was taken up dead, St. Paul didn't think, well, maybe we need to resuscitate him, do CPR or fix his neck and he'll rise up again. They were in the middle of the liturgy and the only solution they had was to pray and their idea was that the liturgy will raise him up from the dead. So I hope that as we approach here inside the liturgy and as we approach our spiritual life, whether we pray at home, whether we pray here, that we are hoping that our lives are actually changed. That we, even a Sunday school class, a lesson being listened to is about our life being changed. We read the Bibles at home is about our life being changed. We read a spiritual book is about our lives being changed. We go and serve the poor, it's about our lives being changed. Because our life being changed is the real meaning of repentance, not that I stopped lying or I stopped swearing or I did this and I don't do that anymore. The life being changed is the real meaning of repentance. It is becoming alive after being dead. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Oh, Lord Jesus.